<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Somebody just announced that they uh, had this TV that's showing on my my display here. I think, uh, yeah, me too, and that certainly shows my age. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Spears. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Admin at the University of Victoria, and I also chair the IPAC Victoria Board. And on behalf of the board and our partners, IPAC Vancouver and the UVic School of Public Administration Local Governance Hub, welcome to the current and future challenges and opportunities in local governments in BC webinar. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. So before we begin the panel, um, I'm going to respectfully acknowledge the land I am on today, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And I'm specifically on the lands of the Malahat Nation. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the physical lands, which we each call home. And we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations, to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous people and their cultures, and supporting the 94 calls to action outlined in the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. So from coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. And you are welcome to share what territory you are joining us from, and uh, please feel free to do so in the Q&A uh, function. Uh, just briefly about the process. Um, uh, Dr. Krichenko, she's an award-winning member of our faculty at the School of Public Administration and is currently also the co-chair of the Local Governance Hub, and she will be facilitating today's webinar. And I will put a link to her bio if you would like to learn more about Dr. Krichenko and especially her uh, fascinating research interests in the Q&A function. Dr. Krichenko will be taking questions from the floor throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions you would like to ask the participants, please pose a question at any time during the presentation via the Q&A function. I will be helping her manage the chat function during the session and what that role I usually call is the Zoom bouncer. So that's me today. Uh, today's presentation will be recorded, and if you would like the transcript function to work, each individual now has to turn it on individually. Um, before I uh, introduce Dr. Kachenko, who will be introducing the panelists, um, please note that IPAC Victoria, along with partners such as Vancouver and uh, IPAC, will also be hosting other webinars in the next four months and some of them include giving frank and fearless advice, artificial intelligence in the public service, resiliency planning, and how to be an ally in the public service. Please also consider becoming a member of IPAC Victoria or Vancouver. So I guess right now I'm passing the virtual uh, hat around, um, but there's lots of value to uh, being a member of IPAC. And then depending on where you live, you can become a member of uh, the regional groups as well. Um, and also um, if you would like to get involved in other, uh, either organization, please let us know as well. So not only membership, if you want to uh, get involved in volunteering, please let us know. Um, and also, if you would like to join the School Public Administration Local Governance Hub, please join the hub and Tamara will be putting the links in the Q&A section on how to do this as well. And now I am handing the virtual baton to Dr. Krichenko, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you so much, Kim, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have excellent panelists to chat with us about future challenges and opportunities. I'm going to start off with some introductions. Um, after this, we'll ask them to make introductory statements, and then we'll have a few questions, and we'll be taking questions from the audience. So to start off, Todd Pugh, who is Executive Director of Civic Info BC, and also an instructor, we're really lucky to have him at our School of Public Admin and also at Capilano University. And he started his career in local government, not to age you, Todd, but in 1994, 
um, <laughs> working in a parks department in a regional district of BC's lower mainland. And 27 years later, he's still dedicated to local government as the executive director which is of Civic Info BC, which is a Victoria-based not-for-profit information and data service. If you don't know it, it's a fantastic website and uh, go check out their stuff. And at Civic Info BC, Todd has helped to develop many innovative services, including the country's largest local government jobs board, municipal stat service, the first province-wide municipal election results reporting system in Canada, which is really cool. So it's super innovative. And he teaches in our program here in the local government program, which is fantastic because he has such hands-on experience to share with our students. He also has two kids and his hobbies include recreational hockey and then recovering from all those injuries from recreational hockey, which is why I've never played recreational hockey and, uh, and gardening. So thank you so much, Todd. Welcome. We're also joined by Dr. Kennedy Stewart, who many of you may know, who is an associate professor at the SFU School of Public Policy and also the director of the SFU Center for Public Policy Research. He's a former member of parliament from 2011 to 18 and was also, of course, mayor of Vancouver from 2018 to 2022. As a political scientist, his research and teaching looks at democratic governance, public policy theory, practice, leadership, cities, all that good stuff. And he's delivered a lot of important work that he'll tell us about shortly. He was official opposition critic for science and technology, and he led opposition to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. He brought e-petitioning to the House of Commons. And as mayor, he led this massive organization with a massive budget through the COVID-19 pandemic, moved forward on reconciliation efforts, secured a billion in social housing investment, and the adoption of the Broadway plan and push to decriminalize drugs. And that's something we understand that you're working on now with your new book that's gonna be coming out called Decrim, How We Decriminalize Drugs in BC. And he has taught at many universities and publishes uh, at a lot and is very busy. So thank you for joining us and for sharing your expertise with us today. And also welcome to Susan Bryce. Thank you so much for being here. Susan is a Canadian politician. She represented the Electoral District of Saanich South in the Legislative Assembly of BC from 2001 to 05. She's a mem she sat as a member of the BC Liberal Party. And currently she's a member of Saanich Municipal Council and was elected first in 2005. So really long um, career in local government as well. And Susan Bryce was an elementary school teacher, like my mom, and an elected trustee to the Victoria School Board from 75 to 1980, and worked also as the chair of the board from 78 to 79. She was elected councillor to municipality of Oak Bay in 1980s, and as a mayor in 1985, has served as a director on the Capital Regional District Board from 85 to 90, and chaired the board from 88 to 89, and Mrs. Bryce also served on the board of the Better Business Bureau. So thank you. I mean, what an incredibly long career and dedication to local government in BC. Wonderful to have you with us. Nice to be so here. I now invite you all, um, all of our panelists to start us off, you, you know, in, a, in five minutes, you in a nutshell, um, what are the, you know, the future challenges and opportunities, the big picture as you see fit. And now, and Todd, if you don't mind, I'll I'll start with you um, and then go in the same order. So the sure, floor thanks. is yours. Oh, th thanks. I, I do appreciate the question. And uh, five minutes, well, this is a question that could take five hours or five days or five weeks. Uh, the issues are enormously complicated. So I had to give a little bit of thought to what I think the elevator pitch would be. Uh, and, and I would invite Susan and Kennedy to jump in at any time, please, because I, I kind of like the uh, format where we're feeding off of one another. That works well for, for me and hopefully for uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, so the, the big challenges, the, the really big ones, and uh, I, I should start by saying my perspective is shaped a lot from my time in the classroom. I do not come from the elected official background that uh, my colleagues on the line do, uh, but in the classroom, my my courses are generally speaking for mid-career local government professionals about 30 in my class at any given time i have had 16 years in the class listening to their experiences uh confidential conversations term papers you name it and i'm also out a lot traveling uh meeting with the staff here and there and everywhere so what am i hearing of course the big one housing that one goes without saying i'm sure we're going to touch on that i would be shocked if we didn't Right now, inflation, the rising cost of labor, the rising cost of materials, everything going north, 
it's a, it's a huge issue impacts every aspect of a local government's organization and we're all dealing with it it's a massive one the other massive one that i'm hearing time and time again the labor shortage uh, in my introduction, you mentioned that uh, Civic Info BC runs the country's largest municipal job board. We have seen a 40% plus increase in the number of postings that we're receiving just in the last three years alone. It's not going away. That's indicative of retirements. Demographics are working in that direction. It's indicative of what we're seeing people just uh, done after the uh, after the COVID years. Uh, and it's just, it's everywhere. We are having a tough time filling jobs. Infrastructure deficit and asset management, they're linked. We still have crumbling infrastructure here, there, and everywhere. Uh, my, my colleagues on the line dealt with that uh, week after week in their respective councils or are dealing with it, I'm sure. Another big one, homelessness, mental health, addictions, opioids, all linked together. I'm sure we'll get into that. Crime, also a big one. Um, protective services, huge um, costs and uh, issues related to the fire service, police services. Uh, those roles have changed big time in the last number of years as well. Uh, again, linking, linking it back to the opioid uh, crisis, um, I'm talking to firefighters these days whose jobs uh, involve going out and reviving folks with naloxone kits several times a day in some cases. It's not responding to structure fires. It's those kind of medical emergencies. That's massive. Climate change adaptation, huge. Lack of civility and codes of conduct at the local level. At the public level as well, um, we, we we're seeing social media venom like we've never seen before. Low voter turnout, uh, relationships with First Nations. Oh my God, it's a laundry list. It's a, it's a huge laundry list. So those are where I see the challenges. Um, Future challenges and opportunities. Maybe, maybe I can throw to to, to Kennedy and Susan first, because uh, again, I've just sort of set the table, and they may have some very specific things that they would like to uh, get into on any of those or other topics. Great, thank you so much, uh, Kennedy. Over to you. Uh, there we go. Just uh, muting myself. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. A real pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel and audience. I uh, do want to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth people, and I uh, considered that those my most important relationships while serving as mayor and did everything I could to um, uphold our, our attempt to be a, a true city of reconciliation. Um, when I was invited to this panel, uh, my mind, you know, I, I love Todd's laundry list of things. And of course, that uh, kept me staring at the ceiling for many, many nights uh, as mayor. Uh, but what I thought about was uh, the infrastructure part of, of the discussion. Um, so uh, what I saw as mayor is we have a mismatch between our uh, needs for financing uh, infrastructure, both um, uh, repair uh maintenance and also expansion and how we actually negotiate for money from specifically from the federal government um so just for background the municipalities own 62 percent of the core infrastructure in canada that's about uh 1.3 trillion dollars worth of assets which is a massive amount 32 percent of these assets are in fair poor or very poor condition and climate change is only making this worse. We've had uh, in Vancouver, we've had our seawall basically destroyed uh, every year. We've had now uh, pools in Kitsilano that become cracked from king tides. Uh, so, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so, uh, and of course, on the flip side, local governments only collect about 12% uh, of every tax dollar in Canada. So we have a, a big mismatch uh, between our ability to fund both repairs and, and expansion. Uh, and 97% of that money comes from property tax. So we have a basically, especially if you're in a, a rural municipality, we have a little bit more flexibility in urban centers with the user fees and whatnot. But if you're in smaller, uh, less populated municipalities, it's, it's almost all coming from property tax. Um, so I just want to put this one in your mind. Uh, one infrastructure project that, that's uh, pressing here in the lower mainland is the Iona uh, sewage treatment plant, which... Um, uh, first accounts was going to cost uh, the metro region two billion dollars. It's now ballooned to ten billion, uh, and by the time it's finished, uh, you was at on forty percent. So you can see fourteen, fifteen billion dollars for one infrastructure replacement project that is mandated by the federal government. We're already behind. Um, uh, you know, the effluent that's coming out of that plant is is already below federal standards, uh, and. Um, 
And uh, so <laughs> we're in big trouble. If, uh, if Metro paid for this themselves, it would add uh, $500 onto everyone's property tax bill just for this one single project. So, so I started working on this, uh, Seb Dollywall, who was the chair of Metro, um, who this was the biggest file on his desk. He talked to me and said, we're not having any luck accessing federal government, uh, the federal government uh, in terms of helping to fund this, this project. Uh, and the way the system works in Canada is premiers are usually their own intergovernmental affairs ministers. And so um, Donic LeBlanc is currently the, the infrastructure minister, uh, the intergovernmental affairs minister nationally. And so premiers will often talk to Dominic LeBlanc, but the premiers don't usually pitch infrastructure. The premiers are usually pitching healthcare dollars, uh, childcare dollars, more operational dollars, and they tend to not pitch for infrastructure. And they also don't pitch for potential uh, for projects, especially big ones like sky trains or, or, uh, or a major road construction highways. Uh, and so there is this mismatch where if, if cities are going to, if this is going to be offloaded to them uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that this infrastructure gets built and this massive amounts of money, how do we access the federal government? It doesn't go through the province. And so uh, what I found is that the feds would actually come to me and say, as, as mayor, you know, what are the infrastructure projects in Metro that you think we should be working on? Didn't have a lot of um, success uh, partnering with the province in terms of answering these pitches. And so basically it was me taking my best guess as to what the Fed should fund. Uh, the Feds were really only willing because they only have so much time to talk to mayors of, of large municipalities, uh, especially in a very fragmented system like we have here in, uh, in British Columbia. So they're not going to go to all 21 uh, metro municipalities and ask them what their infrastructure choices are. So really, I kind of had to work against my own interests sometimes to, um, to pitch for other municipalities, like, for example, the gondola in, in, uh, in, in Burnaby. So uh, what I want to point out at this, at this stage, uh, and just in my, in my five minutes, is that who's really lobbying at the federal level for municipalities? Uh, the large organizations like FCM, UBCM, uh, they do general funding pitches, but they do not do specific infrastructure pitches. And who does do specific infrastructure pitches are the mayors of the big cities and the rest of Canada. So I uh, knew John Tory very well before, before he stepped down. He was an awesome lobbyist for his city. Uh, Valerie Plant from Montreal, very, very good. Uh, Calgary and uh, Edmonton mayors the same. So that's who we're competing against. And if we don't get our pitches together, the feds are just going to slide money to those other bigger cities. And so we are losing out. Um, and I think that's one thing. It's kind of a structural thing that we have to correct. And uh, my suggestion would be that uh, and I have made this to the premier is that there is a uh, that there is a separate intergovernmental affairs minister. You kind of break that off from from his current responsibilities and hand that to a, um, a cabinet member that has good links to Ottawa to help uh, with provincial infrastructure, but also at the municipal level. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Great points. And of course, we want to make sure that our systems are fit for the future as well and uh, that we're not working at cross purposes. Susan, over to you. You have the floor. Thank you very much and delighted to be joining you from the territory of the Wasanich peoples. And Todd and Kennedy have really uh, uh, captured so many of the issues. I feel I've just read every agenda that's found by my <laughs> radar screen in the last. Uh, years. And so I won't sort of repeat all those issues because I totally agree with, with each of them. They're all important. A couple of things that I might just sort of add to it. Um, I always think sort of the overarching purpose role of, of local government is, you know, community well-being, community. Yeah. And even though we're connected with other layers of government, it is the, uh, the government that is the uh, uh, voice that is closest uh, to the people. And in keeping with what uh, Kennedy has said about us uh, attempting to get resources from other layers of government to our communities, um, I've found that over the last few years, there's been way more demand for much more um, thorough uh, strategic planning and multi-year financial planning. Used to be in the day somebody could come to a council table and if they had a good idea and were a good sales person, they could kind of 
uh, get it in the council of the day would sort of go off in that direction. I find things have become way, way more um, uh, planned, way more strategic. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing, given the, uh, the resources issue and all these, these heavy demands. Another uh, thing that I would add to this mix of issues is the intergenerational equity issue, which I have found permeates so many of the decisions now uh, at uh, government. Uh, we realize that there is a feeling uh, among uh, many in the community, our uh, residents and people we work with at the council table, that there's a sense that maybe um, the previous generation had it all good and it's tough, tough times now. Uh, housing is a, a problem. Um, all of these uh, climate change, big, big issues. So I think it's something to sort of bear in mind when we're doing the, uh, the work of local government that um, there's a mix of um, attitudes in the, uh, the public and in the, the decision making. I think uh, most of the issues that uh, I had on my list uh, certainly have been covered. One uh, that does touch my community that hasn't uh, uh, been mentioned is the protection of farmland. And uh, that with its sort of encroachment from this uh, need to provide more housing and sprawl and so on uh, is something that we as a council have uh, taken uh, very seriously. And we have an urban containment boundary and uh, it is as close to sacrosanct as you can get uh, in anything which is within a, a changing uh, sort of decision-making milieu. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, with everything that has been covered, I'm gonna pass it uh, back to you, Tamara, and uh, let's see uh, what the issues are that people wanna talk about today. Um, there's so much we could build off of because the, those those are so many, I mean, these are complex and interwoven issues. And then how does one prioritize, right? Um, and as you're as you're trying to look for the future to the future ever more in, in ever more strategic manner, I would like to start off by looking to the past few years because COVID was this inflection point. It was a huge challenge and actually it revealed some of the ways in which we organize ourselves, which are problematic, and also how we could work better and more collaboratively in the future, I think, uh, including across levels of government. So maybe I'd welcome your experiences and thoughts on what we learned from the COVID pandemic at the local government level, and what this tells us about how we can organize better to address some of the big challenges that you just mentioned going ahead. I'll start with maybe an observation, and this is, I hope, a positive one. I think local governments during the height of the pandemic proved themselves to be a lot more adaptable and changeable than anybody necessarily gave them credit for uh, prior to March 2020. We were asked to pivot and change in so many different ways. We were uh, we were talking about it just before we went live with the meeting. Uh, you know, shut down your downtown, reopen your downtown. Uh, you know, can I have people walking around in trails and parks? Do I have to disinfect my playground equipment? I mean, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff that was going on. Uh, local governments, I think, kind of shook off the uh, perception that they are slow to move and slow to change just because change happened so rapidly. Uh, Kennedy and Susan, I'd love to know what your thoughts were from your perspectives. Right, go ahead, Susan. Well, certainly here in Saanich, um, uh, it was exactly as you uh, you say, after the first moment of shock and awe, I was absolutely um, amazed at how quickly um, senior staff uh, formed in a uh, an emergency center and uh, all the decision makers, I mean, were all put online and uh, this type of thing. I I was impressed, and it is interesting how a situation like going through a pandemic, you very, very quickly prioritize because you certainly can't do everything you were doing. And then without too much um, uh, fuss, it was determined, you know, what are the things we have to do? How are we going to get them done? And uh, I think uh, local government uh, proved itself uh, worthy of the task. Now, uh, as has been suggested, uh, there's the 
uh, go forward and what do you learn from it and take forward and uh, that's I guess the process uh, that we're all in. I, I don't like uh, thinking about March 2020 very much. Uh, it was um, really a, a horrendous uh, experience um, for really everybody. And I, I still think the trauma hasn't kind of cycled through. I think people are just starting to recognize public business owners. Uh, you know, um, I was on the big city mayor's um, uh, group during that period and 70% of the, those mayors are gone now. I mean, it was incredibly tough on civic governments just, just here in Vancouver, really overnight. Uh, give you one example of uh, something that occupied my mind every night, as soon as the physical distancing orders came in, uh, we have about uh, 160 single room occupancy hotels here that have 7,000 rooms. Uh, and that's where, you know, mostly in the downtown east side, uh, that's where people of, uh, you know, who live in extreme poverty and most uh, mental health and addiction issues, uh, a large indigenous population there too. Um, those hotels have a guest policy where, um, if you're in your room by yourself and you remember these rooms don't have kitchens or whatever, they share bathrooms, uh, you're allowed to have a guest overnight. When uh, the uh, physical distancing orders came in, that guest policy was canceled. And overnight, those rooms were emptied of guests and we had an ex exploding encampments um, all over uh, the downtown. Plus all um, the advantage with folks that have um, that are living with addictions is that if you have a guest with you and you overdose, then somebody can help you. Uh, when your guest is gone, of course, you uh, you don't have that help, and our overdose uh, deaths uh, deaths spiked by seventy percent during that period. So it, it was an extremely traumatic period to which the federal and provincial governments really had no answers, uh, and uh, and th that was you know really a shattering experience. Um, so really, my effort day in and day out was to focus on the most vulnerable people in our city and try to do everything I could to to, to help them. Meanwhile, you have the the rest of the population that uh, don't go downtown anymore, have lost their jobs. Um, you know, uh, and I guess the third thing we thought of a lot was the impact on our revenue streams, uh, where our user fees uh, dried up overnight. Um, plus, I had um, we'd done a survey of of residents, and before the feds came in with any uh, programs like CERB or business bailout programs. Uh, I can't remember, it's about a third of them or a third of residents said they'd only be able to pay half their property taxes. So we were looking at a, a potential drop of 30% of our, our $1.7 billion revenue, which was just, so we immediately laid off 20% of our workforce. And, you know, the senior governments, when I talked to them, they haven't gone through anything like that. They didn't, they didn't really lay off any of their workers. They, they, you know, and who lays off 20% of their workers without strikes? Like, so credit to the, to the local unions that they also absorb this, but, you know, uh, I'm not sure what, what it's like in other municipalities, but large municipalities have not recovered. Uh, Toronto is still operating at a billion dollar uh, deficit, which of course is not allowed. Um, and, the uh, more uh, direct operating funding is going to be needed from senior governments if you're going to get your big cities back on track. Kennedy, I, I don't think the smaller local governments have recovered entirely either, although I do think there's an easier time for them because the distance they have to come back isn't as great. The revenues that they have to recoup is not as much. And uh, your, your points on the um, drop in property tax revenue are well taken. During the pandemic, we did some work with some of the different municipal agencies, including the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, we have a municipal finance authority as well, and we are looking at what percentage of uh, residents across British Columbia would be able to pay their property taxes during the COVID pandemic. We didn't know. None of us knew. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there was a threshold beyond which we were concerned about uh, collapse of the system. Yeah. Mercifully, it didn't come to that. But those were very frightening days. Mm -hmm. We we inevitably are going to have to talk about fi finance, money. It comes down to it. Money is capacity. Money is doing things. The fact that um, municipal funding is counter cyclical is problematic, as you point out, during a recession. And moreover, we have to think about whether the present architecture of public finance in Canada is fit for the future, right? And so I think, can I ask you about money? And is our architecture of public finance for local governments 
fit for the future? Um, and if not, what do we do about that? And this is always something comes up because people complain, oh, municipalities, they're always saying they just need more money, more money, more money. What, what do we what do we concretely do? <laughs> well, I could talk about uh, one uh, possible new revenue source, uh, uh, which involves the World Cup. So um, we, uh, you know, um, being, uh, British Columbia said no to hosting World Cup games uh, in, I think, 2030, right? And uh, however, it had discussions with uh, real fans of the game who uh, who wanted games in Vancouver and so uh, started lobbying to to get uh, World Cup games here in Vancouver um, and then got the the, the uh, then Premier Horgan to, to change his mind and say that that was something we want to do here. We have landed those. However, there's the whole who's going to pay for that? Um, so um, what we've done is activate uh, basically the hotel tax here in the city. Uh, so um, the, the uh, you know all the tourist folks and hotel owners agreed to this, and we're able to now uh, charge uh, you know a, um, a certain dollars per room, and then that goes into a fund which will help us pay for the games as they're here. Uh, but then I thought, well, why roll that back? Why not just have that uh, you know as as a source to help safer infrastructure uh, payments. And so, so that does show there's a willingness if maybe you can attach um, uh, funding, you know, in, you know, changes to the system to particular events. So that that might be one way forward, but, uh, you know, everybody's arms get crossed as soon as you talk about uh, longer term sources, unless you can really pitch it to them in a way that will save them money too. There's yeah. um, the Union of BC Municipalities Strong Fiscal Futures documents that uh, I think I flipped the link to the uh, panel rather than to everybody. So maybe if I could ask uh, Tamara to, to flip that out to the group. Uh, it's got some interesting reading about alternative revenue streams for, uh, for the bulk of the province. It's a discussion paper, but it's worth reading. Uh, the question was too, it, it, is what we have now enough? And uh, to me, the short answer is no, it's not. Uh, and it's not because local governments are, you know, this money hungry bottomless pit for, for tax dollars. Uh, that's not it at all. The scope of what local governments has been, uh, have been responsible for in the last 10, 15 years has exploded exponentially. We are into health issues. When were we ever into health issues 15, 20, 30 years ago? We were not. Housing is something that is very much on our radar as well. We were always into housing to a certain degree, of course, through land use planning, but never to the degree we are now. Uh, any, anything anything health related, anything uh, housing related, those are new. Uh, emergency related, uh, again, climate disasters that we're facing, emergency response, there are costs associated with that, and that is new. So new revenue streams are needed. I think the UBCM Fiscal Futures document does a pretty decent job of outlining what a lot of those are. Great, thanks, Todd. Yeah, I agree that uh, that report uh, is helpful. And I say again, I think at the local government level, we're really having to up our game in terms of getting our um, strategic plans and our housing plans and our game plan in order so that when opportunities come along, uh, we're uh, in a position to make a pitch. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of competition uh, for uh, senior level uh, government dollars and uh, sometimes um, it is being there having that uh, that forward-looking uh, agenda and being able to uh, to take part in it I know we have discussions too about what things should be paid today and what things should you spread out over if it's a, a long-term investment then maybe you know not just the taxpayers of today should pay for it but over the long term I'm finding as well around the province uh, with colleagues that not only is there a lot of new infrastructure uh, that uh, needs to be built, but so much of our infrastructure is crumbling and coming to a replacement uh, uh, stage. And that never has as much kind of um, political thrill to it uh, from the, the public when they're just seeing things um, replaced. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in many respects, uh, taxpayers are tired. Uh, they really have to be told a good story and they, we owe it uh, as those of us who are in elected office to ensure that they maintain a confidence um, in the system so that uh, 
these investments uh, have to be made because we see what it's like. I've seen when a, a period of time where everybody says, let's tighten the belt and not spend and, you know, zero based budgeting and all of this sort of stuff on the short term seems to have such an appeal that invariably within a short period of time, you see the, uh, the negative effects of that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, could, I, could I add something to, to your comment, Susan, just really briefly? I love what you said about the importance of strategic planning, because that helps to ensure that you're only chasing the dollars that you critically need and that you're not chasing the red herring dollars as well. Those can be a massive cost to local governments that are chasing grant dollars for projects that aren't on their priority list. And that's uh, money that can be better spent elsewhere. So good point. I really like that. And I would also say that um, you know, I find through my four years on this and actually seven as an MP is the provinces kind of get off the hook a little bit because the stuff they really don't want to deal with, they kind of offload it to the municipalities. And then they say, well, it's your problem funded through property tax. And when we can't do it, they have a, they have a convenient place to, to, to lay the blame. Uh, so, you know, one other thing, instead of increasing our, our funding sources would be to simply say, no, this is our responsibility, we'll deal with it. And then that takes all the pressures off the electeds at the at the local level. So, you know, uh, a sorting out of, of who does, does what, I think Enid Slack is kind of famous for doing that kind of work, is that that's a bit of what we have to do here. What can we really handle with our current fiscal arrangement? And I wouldn't say uh, health care and, um, you know, especially uh, is is something we can handle, but even large international events, those types of things, like can we really under our current system handle that? I, I think that's extremely problematic. And so, so that so the province is really, you know, we're their creatures, so mm -hmm. they have to figure out what they're going to do with us. Well, that's right. We might find out uh, in the next uh, few months what the province's uh, message is going to be regarding housing. Uh, Saanich is one of the communities that's on the. Uh, the first uh, list of opportunities to work with the, the province. And so I'm anxious to hear just exactly uh, what um, is coming forward. Um, I think we're, we're all ready to get and go, but uh, we need to, uh, to find out uh, whether or not there's support from the province if we take certain directions. I mean, that's a really, just one last thing is that's yeah. a really good point because um, you know, land use is actually a constitutional responsibility of the provinces that is delegated to the municipality. And so it, if it's not working the way it is, they need to take it back and do something with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very curious to see how far the province of BC will go in this case. Uh, historically, we have had a very hands-off provincial government relative to the relationship that other municipalities in different provinces have with their municipal affairs ministry. So uh, we will see how, uh, how, how far this goes. I'm curious as well. And certainly, you know, the premier has taken it on personally as a, an issue that he's uh, mm -hmm. uh, putting his, his name attached to it. So it's obviously going to get all the resources it's needed at the provincial level. But let's let's see what the game plan is. Well, we we can. I, I mean, I'll, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and then start with the questions from the Q and A. But let's take this head on. You know, BC culturally, local government has been called the relationship in BC is gentle imposition. Is it time to move on from gentle imposition to imposition, direction, because we're re really not meeting housing goals, we're not meeting um, many of our goals related to, to climate, which are tied to land use um, governance. Do we need to shift from a culture of gentle imposition to, to be strategic for the future challenges that we face, current and future challenges? I'll start with an observation. Uh, I just returned from a conference of the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators. Lots of local governments in the room from provinces where the uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs is more interventionist. Those problems exist just as acutely, if not more so, elsewhere, just the same as they do in BC. So I don't believe that an interventionist uh, approach to local governance necessarily solves the issues. It's interesting. And also, uh, sometimes local government is seen as uh, moving too slowly, having too much process. Um, but I would say you could look at the books, certainly of, of Saanich, and I dare say many other municipalities, and the projects that we have approved, but they've not gone forward, uh, not because of uh, any uh, excessive process at the municipal level, but um, 
it has to make sense from a developer's point of view. And unless it's going to be all, you know, subsidized by other levels of government, um, unless uh, people who are in the business of uh, uh, finding uh, uh, resources to help them fund their projects and, and make it work, uh, it becomes a, yeah, an approved project, but to be actually uh, a place where people are moving into, got a lot of pieces that have to fall into place. I, I think on the housing file specifically, local governments can get it to a certain point. So for example, when I was elected in 2018, I ran on a platform of increasing affordable housing. I set actual targets in my, in my, um, in my platform. Uh, my first year in 2019, I had quite a divided council, which is well documented. We approved about 5,000 new units of housing. In my last year of 2022, we had approved uh, working with First Nations um, locally and with developers, 17,000 units. Wow. So we, we have been managed to, to triple. Uh, but I would say it's why I'm not mayor anymore, because <laughs> a lot of what I approved was in wealthier areas of the city who essentially. Uh, didn't like having even six story uh, apartment buildings uh, on major thoroughfares. So if you look at the electoral map, <laughs> where the, where the <laughs> votes against me came from, were were mainly from the areas where we'd started to put rental housing where there'd been none before. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think local governments can do it, uh, it but there is a definitely a political risk for uh, densification, especially at the scale that uh, I think Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation is saying we need to produce something like 5 million units or so be by 2030 or something. Um, and so uh, so the province is, yeah. So, so I think saying you have to hit these targets or we're gonna cut your infrastructure funding is not good enough. I, mm -hmm. I don't, that still leaves all the political fallout to local politicians. I think it would be much better if the provinces came in with a stronger hand and then the accountability for, for that upzoning essentially lands with uh, the body who's constitutionally responsible for this. That seems honest. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can do that now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question for me and then over to the floor. The question I want to ask as people who work in the local government system in BC, to me, the system, to, I, it was uh, something I wrote my dissertation on. It's Vancouver and in, integrated planning in Greater Vancouver. It seems quite fragmented, right? Because you didn't have these larger amalgamations and there's benefit and drawbacks. And then you have other systems like, um, you know, like Metro Van. But are we are we doing enough to be collaborative or our or or are the sort of frameworks that local governments face inherently competitive? Um, you list the list of challenges that you've described here. Those are big challenges facing local governments. They absolutely need to build scale to be successful in addressing many of them. Um, you know, do we have a system in place that really encourages that? And if not, what more could we do um, to, to encourage collaboration, especially with rural municipalities and, uh, and especially with First Nations? I can take an initial crack at that. I think we do have the institutions in place, but I think it's underappreciated what the regional district structure is in this province. Uh, regional districts at their best are forums for intermunicipal cooperation. At their worst, they are a forum that people assume is the same as a county or a second tier uh, level of local government that you see in other provinces, where there is some sort of a, you know, us and them sort of a power dynamic between the municipalities and the, uh, and the regional level. That's not how BC is structured legally. So I think there is an education piece as new people come into elected office, as new senior staff come into their positions on what regional districts can actually do and how they can work better to, to serve that need for interjurisdictional cooperation. And uh, I, I was on the uh, roadshow with the Local Government Leadership Academy in the spring talking to the uh, newly elected officials forum. This is a, uh, this is a point I was speaking to there as well. Um, regional districts do not include non-treaty First Nations at this point in time. I don't think we're going to uh, truly get ahead until that changes. We need to be looking at a change to the way they work to include not only the Treaty First Nations, but non-Treaty First Nations as well. We're all here. We all have the same issues in terms of service delivery. We all need to work together. Yeah, totally uh, agree. I've uh, seen some, um, with the existing structure anyway, uh, opportunities over the years where uh, we have seen regionally uh, that we would be better doing it 
together. And so sometimes rather than waiting to get a yes from everybody around the table, which can slow things down, we've sort of dealt to, in many of these cases, like with, with housing and, and some others, to so go first with a, um, you know, the uh, coalition of the willing uh, and that the communities that do see it and are prepared to invest in it uh, can get started. And then it is amazing uh, to see uh, others see how uh, positive it is. And before you know it, uh, most, if not all, uh, come and that becomes a new service uh, uh, at the CRD. But sometimes it uh, takes some a little positive examples to stop that resistance. So it doesn't become just as you were saying, Todd, seen by people as just another great big layer, another layer of government. Um, I think uh, the regional district system worked well for some time, but I have to say I'm a, I'm a fan of amalgamation and, and uh, where that, uh, you know, Toronto is probably a good example of, of where that took place initially, although you'll say that they're too fragmented now and they should probably amalgamate again. Uh, a lot of this stems from policing. This is kind of what drove uh, amalgamations, uh, some of them anyway, in, in uh, Ontario. But when you have, um, just being the chair of the Vancouver Police Board, uh, the fragmentation is is very detrimental to um, the coordination of police services in, in, in Metro. Um, and um, for example, if you look at like crime maybe have been more localized in the past, but now it's much more international. So if you think of anti-terrorism or cybersecurity, the smaller, uh, you know, Port Moody police uh, can't really invest the resources it needs. And so it subcontracts from the VPD anyway. So I, I think really, as it has in the past, the kind of policing needs may drive uh, more integration, although any province that takes that on is, uh, you know, in for a world of pain. I, I also think that, you know, I'm sitting, you know, when I'm sitting at the big city mayor's uh, caucus or was sitting there with a population of 700,000 people and I'm up against John Tory or Val Plant that have much, much bigger uh, voting bases, uh, which particularly are concerned to the liberals, it's very difficult for me to outpitch them. So that is one big disadvantage. Uh, J J uh, Doug McCallum and I tried our best because we were the two representatives there, but to pitch say new transit uh, investment, but Toronto and Montreal are always gonna come out on top just because they have more federal seats. So I do think this uh, fragmentation is disadvantaging us. And, and but again, <laughs> who who's brave enough to look at uh, a restructuring, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There, 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 it's certainly a hot button issue that comes up. Uh, it, it, it seems to go away for a few years and then it comes back and it goes away and it comes back. And uh, I, I don't know, Susan, if you're, uh, you, you're looking at it now at Sandwich, I think on the governor's review side of things yet again. We are, we're uh, embarking on a citizens assembly oh, at, at the um, pros and cons of amalgamation Victorian Sandwich. Sure. And uh, so that, um, yeah, it, it will be interesting. I mean, that we've taken the approach where we've got a facilitator, we're going to be hands off and uh, leave it to uh, uh, those who are prepared to take this on and we'll, we'll look and see what they, they come up with. I think some feeling is that, uh, you know, there's 13 municipalities in Greater Victoria. Uh, so if you did this, you'd still have, you know, 12, but uh, obviously, what would happen, I would think, if you did get uh, some form of integration or amalgamation, that it could trigger um, an interest in uh, other communities. Mm -hmm. becoming that. I, I like the. I still like the idea of regional districts as the body to coordinate services in that regional way that Kennedy is uh, speaking to. Policing is mm -hmm. a brilliant example. Of course, regional policing comes with some advantages for sure. When you do amalgamations in the smaller levels, uh, at the smaller uh, local government level, sometimes the effects are not, um, they're not what was intended. You see costs rise because it's the yeah. highest cost collective agreement that's adopted by all of the amalgamated municipalities. You sure. see citizen dissatisfaction because they don't have the same level to, of access to their elected officials that they had. Okay. One of the common things, and, and, and fun, funny to be here with the UVic Local Government uh, Hub, uh, when I was a grad student research with the old Local Government Institute, I, I did a lot of work with Dr. Uh, Bob Bish. This was one of his topics. Yeah. And uh, you know, when, when, when he was looking at amalgamation costs, uh, one of the questions comes up is, well, how, 
how much do you save by getting rid of so many different councils? And, so, yeah. and, and the answer is tiny, because even today, when you look at the cost of a council relative to a municipal budget, it's less than 1%. You're really not saving anything by uh, having fewer elected officials. Funny yeah, it true. was never a fiscal argument. Yeah. No, no, but it never I, was. I would just say, if you amalgamated, say, Victoria Sanitary area into one large municipality, all of a sudden your lobbying uh, potential at, at the provincial level is you would you would outdo Vancouver in a second because your population and vote base. So I mean there is I, I have read and actually written about you know costs of amalgamation and stuff and and but one thing that's left out often is the ability to secure federal and provincial like large investments and they're not small like a SkyTrain is four to twenty billion dollars or something like and if you so I mean that's one thing that should be factored. No perfect system, but no, there, there really isn't. And, and this is, yeah. this would be a fun debate for another session. Like it, yeah. it, it, it could be a blast actually. It's yeah. never in the accounting. I'd like to go to some of the questions posed by our audience. Uh, the first one was actually in the chat and it's from a student here. Uh, she's fantastic. Sonia Zoller. She's also a research assistant and she's just amazing. And she's a PhD student at the school of public admin. And she's doing her PhD work on uh, housing issues in Vancouver, Victoria. And she's asking, uh, she'd be interested in hearing from you all on what your views are as the most, like what is the most significant institutional barrier or barriers facing urban mm -hmm. municipalities and addressing mm -hmm. homelessness and responding to encampments? Like why can we just not, what, 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 what's preventing us um, from really action on this front? I can just give you an example at Strathcona Park uh, that was right at, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had 500 tents in, in Strathcona Park. Um, you know, uh, there was a, a lot of pressure to get an injunction uh, and go in and, and kind of explode the park like it had been done in, say, Toronto. I would not do that because, you know, at that point, there were families in there because they had, you know, they lost their jobs through the pandemic or whatever. There was... Uh, so um, what we did is work with David Eby and with um, Ahmed Hassan uh, federally, and I think we got secured about $300 million to buy hotels and renovate them and, and those types of things. Uh, so, uh, you know, and eventually the, the park was uh, empty voluntarily. Uh, now that hasn't solved homelessness in, in the city, but it, it was one, one way forward. And so the barriers, money, but where there's need, I think, um, and, and it's weird, the, the feds are driven by new units. That's what they invest. So if we want to refurbish an old hotel, they won't do it. But if they want, you want to buy a new one that turns it into permanent housing, and that's their metric. So once you understand the metrics of the feds, then you can kind of help shape your pitch. And so, uh, you know, money is definitely it. But I think the money can be there if, if you, uh, if, if you, uh, you know, as, as Todd was saying, get your pitch ready and, uh, and that, but it's just money in the end, I think. I think, um, you know, there's the housing component and if people are healthy and unhoused, uh, that's sort of one kind of tranche. If people have um, mental health and addictions as well as being unhoused, uh, to have the concomitant services uh, supporting the housing, that's another sort of dimension. There is certainly uh, evidence, I think, everywhere that um, uh, on-site uh, supervision and assistance uh, goes a long way to making the all of the residents in a facility, you know, feel comfortable and uh, safe and, and well housed. So there's, you know, there's that other health component again, quite outside of the housing. Todd, did you want to weigh, weigh in on that as well? Oh, I, I posted a link in the uh, chat to a recent case at the city of Prince George that uh, may give some insights into some of the complexities of, uh, of this issue when it comes to local government action or perceived inaction. The uh, legal minefield that, uh, that has to be navigated is truly stunning, and uh, those who act hastily are often... Uh, surprised by the legal consequences. So I give you that Prince George story simply as an example. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. I'd like to go to a question from Dr. Trevor Hancock. He's a retired professor in public health and social policy um, here at HSD. Um, and he's a real change maker in our community working on uh, a healthy planet. And yeah, he just is organizing a lot at the local level. And he, he says, 
In December um, 2020, the UN Secretary General said, the state of the planet is broken, humanity is waging war on nature, this is suicidal. The planetary ecological crisis is more than just climate change, it's also biodiversity loss and pollution, and Canada has an ecological footprint equivalent to five planets worth of biocapacity, and that is roughly true locally as well. So to what extent do you see the need to become a one planet community, an important challenge? And what do municipalities need to do to address it? Thanks, Trevor. Well, we certainly uh, adopt the one planet um, uh, policy and are working hard to bring all of our policies and actions into to place with, uh, with that. I mean, it is, I think, at its very essence and understanding, as Trevor says, that uh, it is global and it uh, is has so many facets to it that, um, yeah, it's no longer just good enough to sort of give it the, the lens as they always, they said. Um, and I think this is another uh, intergenerational issue. I think a lot of young people are very angry. Uh, they do not see um, their, forefathers leaving them with a a planet that uh, is in good shape so uh, yeah uh, anything uh, uh, Trevor recently uh, presented to us at uh, at the CRD and uh, we're always uh, glad to get advice from somebody like that in our community I love the ability that local governments have to do small things at that local level that maybe make a, a, a big impact when they're added together across hundreds of communities. Uh, that, that still excites me and I, I can rattle off a bunch of local examples. Uh, I know one, there's one municipality like well, there's several in the CRD. Uh, Susan maybe Sandwich is one. Are, um, loans interest-free loans for um oh god the the heat exchange units the heat pumps uh for, for residents just you know that's a beautiful, yeah, yeah you're doing that central sandwich is doing that come across one other example city of nelson in the kootenays uh, they do not have uh, to my knowledge a green waste recycling program of their own but what they do have is a pilot project where they are giving local residents a, a little countertop uh, composter uh, and uh, they're, they're being encouraged to get rid of their green waste that way small but pretty cool on the local level. Yeah, I agree that municipal sharing is is a big part. You know, the innovation happens locally, and then it spreads through great organizations like this one that, that people kind of pick up, and that can make a an overall dent. I mean, really, the, the if you're talking emissions, it's buildings and 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 transportation. Yeah, that's right. And so, like with buildings, like you know, we went through the lead standard phase, and now we're on passive housing. Uh, the, the only uh, problem is that two things, when you add a lot of environmental uh, regulation to buildings, it, it slows down the process and it increases the costs. So you've got this. Uh, so again, um, you know, 50% of Vancouver are renters and often the incentives that are given are to homeowners. And so there is an equity piece here as well uh, that is not often considered. So you're giving all kinds of grants to homeowners that already own million dollar homes or $2 million homes. It makes it even harder for those without uh, that not homeowners to get into the market so that's an equity lens we have to look at on the on the transportation side um you know it has to be transit investment and that kind of gets back to my opening pitch is that um you know it's our duty to put the pressure on on those that can raise the capital the two levels of government to to put uh, better transit systems uh, in place and uh, so lobbying can mean a lot but i I feel most hope at the local level myself. I, uh, having spent seven years in Ottawa, where uh, you know I was four years under the Harper regime, where that was that was a little rough in terms of uh, in terms of our international obligations. But it didn't matter who was in office; the local governments are still plugging away and and sharing it, even across you know folks that may not uh, be friendly between nations at the local level. Cities still talk to each other, so that that's uh, the it's probably the best hope I would think at, at local levels. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question next from Leif Douglas, who I understand is an incoming a MPA student in our program. And I'll, I'll just paraphrase it that, you know, with the perceived lack of action on homelessness, the overdose crisis and community safety issues, local governments are getting blamed, a little bit provincial, but why do the feds, why do they get away with, um, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not being blamed so much? I, I don't know if I fairly paraphrase that, but more or less, um, you know, they have critical roles to play, and yet they don't seem to have the same level of criticism, as he says. 
Well, that's a question for you, Kennedy, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I mean, the, you know, we're very locally focused and we know our populations and we're, we're you know, out in the whatever grocery stores and talking to people. But look, Ottawa is a very weird place to work. It is this bubble of you know 338 people that are debating each other all the time they have they have to appeal to a national audience of 40 million people it is a very different uh, pressure cooker and it's all and so what breaks through to actually uh, make a difference it's and that's where local government lobbying coordinated lobbying makes it makes a big difference I know like like at the beginning of the pandemic um, we had the big city mayors from the Federation of the Canadian Municipalities get together weekly and the federal cabinet was coming in and talking to us saying, what do you guys need to keep your cities going? And we were saying, we need programs for the population and businesses and help craft that. Uh, so when they're focused and they talk to us, um, you know, they, they can make a difference. But, um, you know, I actually think it's the provinces that get off the hook more than the feds. <laughs> I really do. I do. And I mean, health is a provincial constitutional authority, right? Like the feds regulate drugs, but but it's it's the province that produces the, the health care. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we I think and the thing is it's hard. And I, I know Susan, you're elected at the moment, but it's really hard to criticize the province when you're elected because you depend on them so much. So that's why it's up to us that are outside but concerned to, to do the yeah. work and put more pressure on provinces. Interesting though, when I was the provincial. Yeah. <laughs> elected person I didn't feel anybody had any reluctance to be uh, <laughs> <laughs> criticizing me so um maybe um yeah some of us are too polite I mean <laughs> um, uh, the elected people um what they want is a consistent voice I mean it's when and, and when an issue comes along to a point where a community is speaking as one voice it can be so effective yeah. in lobbying uh, when there's a mixed message, uh, then that uh, worries decision makers because yeah, yeah. they don't want to be in the uh, the game of uh, deciding winners and losers. So, you know, the more we can be certain about our, our path and, and our message. Um, and, you know, it sort of goes sort of full circle to what we were talking about before, because as you were saying, local government um, in many respects is, is still you know the closest to the the public and, and really is the sort of heartbeat of the community um and so i think to some people who get concerned about amalgamations and integrations and stuff that's that's what they don't want to lose you yeah. know um, if you're a community that uh, has a very strong sense of identity um we'll have to make sure that whatever new configurations we make we are still allowing for people to have some kind of contact with their elected officials. Because I think a lot of people feel, well, when somebody goes down to Ottawa, you know, it's the end of it, we never see them again. Uh, as you say, locally, they can um, see all the time. To your point, Susan, I think that maybe why um, the province does not shoulder uh, all the responsibility that local governments do, to Kennedy's point, we are closest to the people. So yes. if you find, if you're a business owner downtown and you find somebody camped in your in your entryway to your store, who is it that you call? You you aren't calling the Ministry of Housing. You aren't calling the Ministry of Health and Addictions. You're calling bylaw enforcement. So I, I I would hazard a guess that all seven of us who are panelists on this call have actually read the Canadian Constitution. I I, I would guess that uh, that we're, we're a little bit of an odd minority that way, and uh, people don't necessarily uh, fully appreciate the jurisdictional responsibilities that are, uh, lie with the province versus what local governments can actually do. Right. In my book uh, on decriminalizing uh, uh, drugs, how that happened, I actually trace drug policy reform, and it's always come from the local level. Mm -hmm. like even even the methadone programs that started in in, in the 1950s uh, came from the local level. Uh, needle exchange programs, um, you know, supervised uh, consumption sites, all of that. You kind of the local level kind of had to make the provincial and federal level brave. They mm -hmm. had. To we're willing to put our like our reputations on the line to do this and now you, and they're really scared that's that's part of what i account in the book but they <laughs> but i but i do think that when you know if we can reflect what our citizens concern in an organized way build allies and then put pressure um especially the feds can kind of pick and choose across the country right and so that's a big luxury and, and they are open to trying new things as long as there's local public support so that uh, 
So environmental stuff that might be, uh, you know, where they might be willing to try new things is if the if the local community is willing to take a risk. Great, great points. Um, I'd like to ask a question before we go to Trevor Berry's question about the implementation of UNDRIP and what that means at the local level. So here in BC, we know the provincial government is trying to understand and developing working groups on what it actually means to implement UNDRIP, including the critical principle of free prior and informed consent. Um, in relationships with both Indigenous peoples and nations who have in inherent sovereignty. And at the local level, of course, there's fluidity, we interact, we mix, and yet local governments are creatures of the provinces, their municipalities, their communities, and nations are nations. It's something very, very different. And what does it actually mean for to implement UNDRIP? What can municipalities do? What are you seeing that's really, really positive there? But I'd also explicitly would like to address the question of economic sovereignty, which is so fundamental to self-determination because our local government, our municipalities, especially our bigger ones, they're our economy and that land is incredibly valuable. And we have nations within or proximate to larger municipalities um, that just don't have enough land and probably the expense of buying back that land. Like, How do they, um, how do we, fundamentally address land back, but also land back as linked to economic sovereignty and opportunity. Well, I can give you an example from, um, uh, so we're planning the SkyTrain out to UBC, the UBCX extension. Uh, when, so how that process worked is, uh, you know, it had to be built into the mayor's plan and then it came down to the municipality where we'd be picking the stations and route, essentially at least proposing them. Uh, before any of that was laid out, I went over to Chief Wayne Sparrow and said, you're the first person I'm talking to about where, where this line would possibly go through your territory and where the stations would best be situated for your community. So before I talked to anybody else, the public or anyone, that's where I went. And we had a proposal they looked at and they thought, this is great. We support it. And that to me was... The second example was on the Olympic bid uh, that ultimately wasn't approved by the province, but uh, that was uh, Indigenous led. So um, the way I described it is four nations plus two municipalities plus the Canadian Olympic and Paralympic Committee, but that order is important. So the nations always decided first what they wanted to have happen. They would inform uh, me and Jack Crompton uh, from Whistler, and then we would talk to the Olympic Committee, and it always worked in that way. They would the four nations would caucus on their own and decided what they wanted, and then and then we would just say yes. So and they had a veto, mm -hmm. and that was uh, it. Kind of blew the mind of the Olympic Committee, like they were used to the other way around. And so mm -hmm. even though it failed, I think it succeeded in the sense that it laid a path for what how to pursue those types of projects. Those are great examples. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good example. We're still. So basically at the relationship building and, and uh, uh, discussions, certainly at the CRD, uh, we're um, getting ourselves um, educated um, with the help of our First Nations uh, partners and uh, municipally, uh, that is a now a, a factor always, uh, consultation and as I say, uh, really in a, uh, respectful way. We have not had an example like <clears throat> you explained, uh, Kendi, which uh, is very exciting when you can actually see it <clears throat> roll out. Um, so I look forward to that. I, I love your example, Kennedy, about going to Chief Sparrow's office in person. I, I'm thinking you went, yeah, that, that that wasn't lost on me, and I don't think that should be lost on anybody on the call here. Uh, so many people think that, uh, oh, they wonder what happens when you send a letter or an email and it vanishes into the ether, and that's just... That, that's not what a new that's not what a relationship is I really struggle with the word reconciliation because it suggests there was a previous relationship that can be repaired in many cases there was no relationship to begin with so you're starting from scratch kind of what you're alluding to Susan and I think when you're looking at uh, how local governments can best implement the recommendations that pertain to them from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, I, I think that's where you start is with um, that visit with taking uh, your counterparts out to coffee. 
building the resiliency across both the political levels of the organization and the staff level so that it, I have seen many relationships collapse because it only existed at the political level and then the winds change and then that's destroyed or it only existed at the staff level and when the staff move on that's destroyed it has to be resilient and multi-leveled I always saw myself as the junior partner I mean I was the mm -hmm. head of, of as a uh as a statutory, you know, a body that was created through statute by the province. Like I'm not, I'm not inherently part of this thing. I'm like a, a bureaucrat in a way that's elected. So, but they are leaders of sovereign nations. So you, you need to, like, if you met the, I don't know that if you meet uh, King Charles, you know, I kind of have that same idea in my mind. And, and that, uh, you know, it's because the nations are small and population doesn't change the status of, of where they are and i and i think when you start with that situation and i actually explain when i in our conversations how i view our relationship and and then you've got to realize the damage that we've done so you know one of a uh, muscular member was uh driving down trutch street and he said i have to drive down the street every day to get back to my house and trutch was like one of the worst uh you know one of the worst reputations of the province the damage can we rename that street and i'm like it actually is quite difficult, but I said, absolutely. What are you going to name it? I said, Musqueam picks. You pick the name and we'll just make it happen. We're not going to interfere at all. And it took them a while. Then we, it's now going to be Musqueam View. Officially mm -hmm. named on G, you know, and I think it's a small thing, but that's what builds trust. And, and you got to let go of control, basically. Yeah. Name, names matter big time. So uh, that's, that's a good story. Can I ask you, I mean, one of the challenges is that this is relational and that politically the leadership changes, but also how do we deliver better relations within how local bureaucracies are organized when people change jobs sometimes every two years? Is there a different system? Do you have a, you know, do you have a different setup for these critical relational aspects um, within local public service. And I just did with chiefs, uh, three local chiefs, it was just personal. They have my cell number. Wayne would phone me from his fishing boat and said he was pissed off about something and I would take that call, right? I mean, that that was how I did it. Now, I don't know how past and current administrations are doing it, but they were always the call I took you know, um, less from Slavel Tooth, uh, more from Squamish, you know, and, and it changes on terms of what what's going on within the municipality. But uh, and I made that clear to my uh, chief of staff and also my uh, city manager that this is a priority. I like where the municipal agencies and associations have gone with this issue in terms of being stewards of um, the information that you need to build relationships. There's some good work that's being done now by our local government management association of British Columbia. UBCM has been uh, doing a lot of good work in this area as well. So even when people do change, whether it's at the staff level after two years, I hope it's more than two years, but we do see it, uh, or whether it's uh, after one term in political office, there are bodies that are there to help and train new people and bring them up to an appropriate standard. It is the most important relationship for sure. Yeah, yeah, it is relationships. And I was just the other day at a fabulously interesting encounter with uh, elected people and representatives from First Nation and they um, were, um, it was led by First Nation and they said, you know, uh, as we go around and introduce ourselves, I don't want to hear what your title is. I don't want to hear what your job is or whatever. I want to hear who are your people? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Wow. That was a profound thing. I was sort of quite overwhelmed as I prepared to say who I was because it wasn't a title. It wasn't a job. It wasn't whatever. It was basically who are your people, meaning who came before you and and who are you? Yeah. But what an interesting lesson for us, though, too, right? I, I, I'm a Southern Ontario farm kid. I, that, that's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. It forms uh, my view of the world today. I moved to British Columbia when I was a teenager, loved this province and its home uh, now. But, you know, that's who I am in a two you know, second summary. And, and how much more personal is that than saying your job title and your education? Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's phenomenal. It's more yeah. meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, Vancouver is as old as Egypt. We just don't have the pyramids, right? I mean, there's been yes. people here for 10,000 years and we just need to 
celebrate that culture, which has basically been erased. I mean, mm. uh, Chief Leah George Wilson said to me, I walk downtown Vancouver and I don't see anything from original inhabitants here, like nothing, no building structures, no, you know, you've got some poles from other nations down in, in Stanley Park, you don't have. And so now we're starting to build into our building design. So the new public library design will have uh, weaving, uh, you know, local weaving design, like, and and that's, uh, and I think the business community is also starting to figure this out and developers mm -hmm. are starting to put this into their designs and real consultation with local artists, which is, will make a, make the city so much more interesting. Well, well, that's a really good point about the local artists too, and, and, and the local flavor, because you know, Vancouver is not in Simshian country. So you, know, you don't want a Simshian totem pole. You know, right. They're representing the First Nation people there. It, it, in fact, it's insulting to some. Yeah, so absolutely. yeah, you have to be very aware of this for sure. It, it's a tricky relationship too, between urban indigenous folks and title holders. Like yes. that has been, wow, that has been a real, um, thing to figure out and try to and try to adapt to so um so that that's definitely something to flag there yeah um let's take a question from trevor berry on the issue of COVID and pivoting he says that he observed many municipalities were in budget finalization at the pandemic outbreak and most significantly scaled back capital spending ostensibly for fear of resident ability to pay property taxes but then CERB came in and capital projects didn't really follow though and now they are paying much larger bills just to catch up so how could this have been avoided did it require more than just sturdier political will by councils inflation yeah. that's what we're all scared of and retroactive rcmp uh service agreements yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> As a minor um, irritant as well, relative to inflation and what Kennedy just mentioned, uh, lack of people. We lost a lot of people. People didn't come back after COVID, so there's fewer to manage the projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think Kenta Trevor Berry's uh, observation, um, local governments, we didn't know uh, what was going to happen, if the bottom was going to fall out or if we were going to be okay. And certainly, um, there was at our council table um, a concerted decision to try and uh, not um, in that first year um, pass on too much. We have recognized that uh, there, it has meant that there has had to be some catch up, but uh, a lot of the factors that come into play are way more than that, that aspect. They are, as Kendi says, inflation. Um, I mean, just the capital projects is just astounding. Uh, even going out to bids now almost seems like superfluous because it's, it's so meaningless by the time you actually come yeah. to do the bill that it's a whole rethink and refinance. So uh, yeah, it's uh, the COVID was a factor, but it's like everything. There's always about five balls rolling along together. And uh, all in all, it is uh, now where it is. Well, I mean, you know, my... Uh... My successor is is not a, a lefty like me and had to raise property tax by 10.7%. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's just going to continue because uh, inflation has hit wages now and uh, Vancouver's in the middle of collective agreement, you know, collective bargaining. Uh, cops usually get like 3% above what, uh, what the QP members get. Uh, and so all of that is going to put an enormous strain. I've kind of as you might see me growing my hair and feeling more relaxed these days, because I, I mean, what's coming is very, very difficult for local governments uh, because uh, operational costs are going to be, it be very, very high if you're going to deliver the same level of service. And with, uh, you know, so um, and at some point, you know, provincial governments used to to provide 50 percent of municipal uh, funds through grants in this province, and now it's about zero. So, I mean, that loss of revenue stream is is enormous and uh, maybe through the gravy days when you could borrow your way out, but with interest rates going up, there's no way this can continue and and uh, it's, it's going to be a discussion right across the country. Yeah. So that really comes down to the uh, fundamental question we have to ask is how are we going to pay for this going forward? Is it through new revenue streams and uh, different models for the local government finance system? Or, or do we need to return to what you're saying, Kennedy, the uh, the, the grant system? Uh, you know, the, this is, these are big questions and big debates to have. I'm afraid that soft services are going to get cut. So like if yeah. you can't cut your protection service, like your police and fire, 
which is about 30% of your budget. You can't cut that. You can't cut your administration or planning stuff. What gets cut is the $2 million a year we give to the Vancouver Art Gallery yeah. or the, right? I mean, and that, the grants will be the first things to go. Yeah. And there, and that, I mean. I our, our, our arts, parks, recreation, culture, you name it. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, that is very tough. That is tough. Let's try and we, as we come to time, think of something optimistic <laughs> to end on. Um, what what are you most optimistic about, actually? And in in all of your various leadership roles, what are you seeing that is just really positive and bodes well for the future, given these types of challenges? Maybe I could uh, just say that one of the things that I've found very exciting is um, our um, goal to uh, uh, support active transportation and to see it go from a concept and um, some discussion uh, to some early adapters to seeing what is happening uh, in our city, particularly with electric bikes and um, more investment in, in sidewalks and so on, that sort of um, movement of people, uh, not just through the automobile. Um, it, it'll be a long time before you can, uh, can say that uh, cars aren't a, a huge significant part of the mix, but I've just seen in a couple of years, quite a transformation. And uh, I find that exciting. I see it every day, people on the ground, uh, what makes me optimistic is I, I had a picture in my office of the uh, first city council of Vancouver uh, in a tent with a little sign outside that said city hall because uh, the city had burnt to the ground. <laughs> and, and then I think, uh, and actually where I live is almost on the exact site where the fire started. So if you think about what has been accomplished in this city uh, since that time through everything, wars and you know, pandemics and recessions and depressions, uh, and you think of what great, great cities and towns we have in this province, you think, well, we have done an enormous amount under very difficult circumstances. So that that will continue like nobody's giving up. It's just acknowledging where you want to put your energies. And so that that's what makes me uh, that's what makes me optimistic. What makes me optimistic is when at election time we work with organizations like Student Vote to give them the fake, well, it's not fake, it's real candidate data that they do mock elections in schools with. What makes me optimistic is to see 60,000 kids every municipal election cycle go and cast their ballot for a municipal candidate in a um, social studies exercise in their school gives me hope that we can get voter turnout up. It gives me hope that we can get a new generation better engaged. It took decades to get to the deplorable levels that we're at. Voter turnout was sub 30% for the first time in a few elections in the last uh, elections in the fall. But I'm optimistic for the future because the kids do seem to be engaged. Yeah, cool. All great optimistic points. Thank you, everybody. Um, Susan, by the way, I moved here specifically for the sustainable transport. I only bike. I have a family of four and we only bike. And we were looking for a place in Canada where we could live car free and and really limit our footprint. And this was it. This is where we chose. So bravo. I mean, this I think municipalities here are delivering incredible things that that, uh, you know, <laughs> are exciting and, and, and really show the way, lead the way. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for participating. I'm going to leave the closing remarks and thanks uh, to Lisa Nye, who is co-chair of IPAC Vancouver and president and CEO of Pinpoint Consulting. She was present, um, presented with the Lieutenant Governor's Medal for Excellence in Public Service in 07 that was issued by the Institute of Public Admin of Canada because of her leadership and extensive experience and impact in the government of BC and in the nonprofit world. So thank you. Um, Thank you to Lisa. Thank you to IPAC Vancouver and IPAC Victoria and LGH for putting this together. But most of all, of course, thank you for your expertise today. I'm really grateful. And uh, it's wonderful to see that there's interest and demand for these types of conversations. So Lisa, over to you. Thanks, Tamara. And thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so again, thanks to the panelists, your wisdom and your experience, your knowledge um, came through obviously strongly today. Um, and this is one of those, another one of those topics, as I think uh, Todd, you might have mentioned, or others uh, that could be engaged over a much longer session. 
And each of you brought that unique perspective and, and experience uh, to this virtual table, uh, really enriching that, understand, that understanding. Um, and thanks to all the participants who came here today. Um, obviously, without your participation, this webinar wouldn't occur. So we need, uh, we need uh, individuals to come and participate and listen and ask great questions. Uh, before thanking others who are involved in hosting, I just wanted to share some uh, key um, takeaways, if you like, from this webinar. Uh, we started out with a discussion around the standing, what are the longstanding issues? Um, I think um, we had a long list that started um, with housing and, and uh, cost of labor materials, labor shortages, COVID, um, which we're still dealing with the impacts of infrastructure deficits, asset management, homelessness, um, working with First Nations in a good way, climate change, et cetera. It goes on and on. Uh, uh, Another panelist commented that the most important uh, matter over the last little while and moving uh, onwards in the future uh, in, a, in a good way is relationships with Indigenous people. Um, carrying on from that, um, we talked a bit about um, uh, every that every agenda that has been mentioned is important. And I think uh, one comment was um, that the overarching purpose of local governments is that community well-being, the voice closest to the people. So keeping that sort of front and center um, and looking at ways to get more uh, resourcing and how to, to uh, plan in, a, in, a, in appropriate ways. We talked a bit about what are some of the issues that have emerged over the last, say, five to 10 years. Um, and I, we got into a bit of discussion uh, as, about COVID. Um, and I think uh, there were comments along the lines of being amazed about how quickly senior staff really created um, the processes and things like emergency centers to move forward. We wonder sometimes when emergencies hit, how we're going to do, but COVID tested us, I think, and that came through in the comments. Another comment was that it was a horrendous experience and the trauma has not cycled through. So we're still dealing with the um, carnage, I guess, and the people that have left and the things that have changed. Uh, financing, finance architecture set for the future, but we'll always need more money. We looked at creative ways to uh, generate revenue, and that was the World Cup uh, example. Strong fiscal futures is what we're doing enough. Uh, again, the answer was kind of no, but looking at ways to um, uh, create more funding streams and, and being innovative. Um, Susan, I think you mentioned about upping our games game again in terms of plan, our, getting our plans in order and that there's competition for government dollars. And so we need to be strategic and, and prioritize and look at how we can really engage those plans. Uh, just kind of moving through, um, I think in terms of some of the uh, uh, questions that were asked, we had some um, you know, really great questions that were uh, posed. Um, and I think at the end, the really uh, kind of interesting part was, um, you know, what are some of those optimistic things? Uh, what are some things that uh, really get us going? And I think we mentioned things like, or you, the panelists mentioned, uh, the goal to support active transportation and the comment that we went from concept to early adapters to what is happening now with uh, electric bikes and really mobile transportation that is um, really uh, people-based. Um, and seeing a transformation even in the last few years on those issues. Um, and the picture of the city council, um, I, I like that one. Um, I think it was Kennedy talking about the city of the council and the tent and how we've really recovered and are very resilient, even though we don't sometimes view that maybe in, in when we're in it. When we look back, we often see that we, uh, as local governments and communities are, are very much um, uh, resilient. And I think the other comment about uh, increasing uh, voting participation and the really engagement by youth and young people in that whole process and the numbers that are changing uh, also seen as a very um, uh, positive, uh, optimistic um, uh, consideration. So with that, I just want to thank uh, all of you, everyone who joined us from across the country. Uh, much appreciation goes to Aaron Bellwood of IPAC National, who always provides the best technical assistance for us to actually do these events and get the word out, and the IPAC Victoria Com team for their marketing. And thank you to IPAC Victoria, Vancouver, and the School of Public Administration Local Government Hub for hosting this event. And again, thank you everybody for coming and uh, participating, sharing your views, and we hope to see you soon at a future webinar that uh, there will be information sent out on. So thank you so much. Thank you.